As you remember in our introduction talk, there are four basic reasons um, that can be the cause of an abnormal opacity in the lung. And the reason we're going to um, focus on in this talk is atelectasis. Um, atelectasis can be um, classified in different ways. Um, sometimes we can classify it according to the amount of tissue involved. Um, lobar atelectasis, subsegmental atelectasis, just referring to how much of the lung is atelectasized. Um, sometimes we may choose to classify atelectasis according to shape. And so that's when you start hearing terms like linear atelectasis or round atelectasis or plate-like atelectasis. Um, alternatively, sometimes we can classify atelectasis according to the mechanism or pathophysiology. Um, we may use terms like passive or obstructive atelectasis in these cases. And um, oftentimes, um, you know, um, you know, which uh, adjective or classification um, scheme we use to describe atelectasis in a report um, may vary from report to report. Um, so at first, it can sound kind of confusing because you're like keeping track of all these different adjectives your attendings are using to describe atelectasis. And in the end, um, they, there's so many terms, but they just represent just terms from different classification schemes that can be simultaneously um, correct. So atelectasis can be passive and subsegmental and um, linear all at the same time. For the purposes of this talk, um, we want to kind of approach things from a pathophysiologic perspective, a mechanistic um, kind of perspective. And we'll explain why in a moment. Um, but some, first of all, just some first principles. Um, what is atelectasis? Um, well, we kind of described it in the um, introduction talk, but it's a situation where um, air has left um, a portion of the airspace in the lung. Um, that can be a small or a large region. And when that happens, uh, what parenchyma remains, um, because it's no longer filled with air, um, occupies less volume. Um, because there's um, just tissue and less gas in this you know, area of, of lung, it now appears to be more dense. And um, whatever structures were in this lung, whether it's blood vessels or airways, now are crammed into a smaller um, uh, uh, amount of tissue, a smaller volume, if you will. Um, and maybe the architecture becomes a little distorted as things kind of shrink. Um, this is what atelectasis is. Um, the amount of territory involved can vary from a small amount to the entire lung. So um, be prepared to look at um, lots of ranges of appearances for atelectasis. And it's um, probably the most common reason to have a focal lung opacity on an inpatient chest x-ray. Um, for some folks, um, I don't know if everyone's uh, played with these before, um, there are these things called shrinky dinks when we were kids, um, these little plastic um, kind of shapes that you could color in with a colored pencil or something like that. You put them in a toaster oven, and they'd shrink and become much more dense in their color and um, even how they felt. And when I think of atelectasis, I still kind of think of shrinky dinks because, you know, lung in this case is shrinking and becoming more dense. All right. So, um, we said we'd um, kind of organize the atelectasis talk on uh, the basis of mechanism. And there's four mechanisms that I want you to be familiar with. Uh, four reasons why lung may become atelectatic. And we're going to just list them for now and then walk our way through how each of these happens. One mechanism is the inherent elastic recoil of lung parenchyma causing atelectasis. Another reason is surface tension of water molecules along the inner surfaces of the alveolar sacs um, causing atelectasis. A third um, cause is just the lack of air replenishment to an area of lung parenchyma as a cause for atelectasis. And the final mechanism is basically scarring that effectively straitjackets an area of lung from being able to expand. Um, a fourth um, reason for atelectasis to occur. Um, we have fancy names um, for each of these um, phenomena. And so uh, uh, when we talk about elastic recoil as the mechanism, we refer to that as passive um, atelectasis. Um, when it's uh, surface tension uh, within the alveolar sacs causing things to snap shut and become atelectasized, we refer to that as adhesive atelectasis. Uh, atelectasis due to um, lack of air replenishment we refer to it as obstructive atelectasis, and atelectasis uh, caused by scarring, uh, we refer to it as cicatricial atelectasis. Now, two of these uh, mechanisms do have um, 
um, synonyms, if you will, or just another word. Some people may choose to re, uh, refer to them, which are interchangeable. Um, so um, some people call passive atelectasis relaxation atelectasis, and some people may refer to obstructive atelectasis as resorptive atelectasis. So don't be thrown if you see terms like relaxation or resorptive thrown around. Those are just synonyms for the ones we're going to use um, in our discussion in this talk. Why? Why care about um, learning about um, atelectasis in terms of um, these different uh, pathophysiologies? Well, um, it's because um, different pathophysiology of atelectasis may result in different imaging appearances. And some of the differential diagnoses are going to be different, which will uh, affect the management. So there are going to be some forms of atelectasis you're going to see, and you're going to go, well, yeah, I expect to see that. And then some cases where you're going to go, whoa, we need to work this patient up for something concerning. So let's start with the first um, type of atelectasis. Uh, that was passive atelectasis. So what happens with passive atelectasis? Well, we're going to do this with a simple diagram. And so what I've drawn here is a blue line. What that basically represents is a simple rendition of a lung. And that blue line represents the airtight visceral pleural envelope that envelops um, a lung. Now, what's interesting about the lung um, is um, if left to its own devices, what does the lung like to do? Well, just like a rubber band, it wants to contract into a smaller amount of space, if it could. So if we were to take like a lobe out, maybe say you're doing a lobectomy, even if we cross clamped um, the bronchus to that lobe and no air left the lobe after we took it out of the patient, put it in the bucket, we may be um, surprised perhaps to see that the lobe actually takes up more, um, less volume than it did say on your CT scan. Um, that's because that lung has now recoiled into a smaller volume. That's what lung likes to do. Now, in a normal person, the lung doesn't recoil into a smaller volume like it would want to because other things exist around it, like the rib cage, which I've drawn in a very system, uh, systematic way or a simpler way as this kind of this uh, beige kind of um, thick line that represents the rib cage. And as we know, along the inner surface of the rib cage is an airtight envelope we refer to as the parietal pleura. And between the parietal and the visceral pleura um, is a small amount of fluid um, that causes those two surfaces, the parietal and the visceral pleural surfaces, to adhere to each other. Um, much like two glass microscope slides adhere to each other if there's a drop of water in between. When you have this kind of situation, um, you know, where you have the lung trying to recoil into smaller volume, it won't because the rib cage is a rigid um, structure. It's not going to let the, um, the recoiling lung cause it to re retract too. And so having a rigid ear, um, rib cage um, around this, um, this uh, lung that wants to recoil, uh, uh, this rib cage is able to um, basically cause an opposing force um, upon the visceral pleural surface of that lung, preventing it from collapsing and recoiling into a smaller volume. And now, there's no rib cage at the bottom of the lung, uh, but there is something, and that's the diaphragm. And along the inner surface of the diaphragm is also um, that airtight membrane of parietal pleura. And every few seconds, when you breathe down and you pull a diaphragm down, at that moment, um, you've counteracted the tendency of the lung to want to recoil um, by um, causing a force on the visceral pleura in an opposing direction. And so in a normal person um, with you know, a rib cage and a diaphragm that pulls down appropriately, the lung is unable to recoil into a smaller space. However, what if... Um, even at your full inspiration, you cannot pull down with as much force as normal because it just hurts too much because you have abdominal pain or because you're obtunded or because maybe uh, you're not sending the signals through your um, neural pathways to tell the uh, diaphragm to pull down. Well, in that case, even at end inspiration, um, the forces that want to cause the lung to recoil, at least inferiorly, get to win out. Um, against the opposing force that would normally pull it out. Um, and what do you get? You get a situation where some of the lung is allowed to recoil into a smaller space and you get atelectasis.
So this is one of the mechanisms for atelectasis, where lung is able to recoil um, because the normal forces that usually are opposing it from recoiling um, aren't there. So um, when the diaphragm doesn't pull down uh, appropriately, is that's one cause of passive atelectasis. Another common cause of passive atelectasis is when this happens. What I'm drawing for you is, uh, what if it's pleural effusion between the visceral and parietal pleural surfaces? Well, if you think of that, those two microscope slides, if we don't have a drop of water, but like an inch of water in between the slides, um, every slide is free to do what it wants. One is no longer adhered to the other. And so if you have a substantial pleural effusion, um, no longer can the rib cage, the diaphragm effect um, force uh, pulling against the, um, the, uh, the innate desire of the lung to recoil, and the lung is able to recoil uh, wherever that pleural effusion happens to be. So passive atelectasis, what are the causes? Well, causes are anything that separates the two visceral pleural and parietal pleural surfaces apart from each other, and anything that prevents the diaphragm from doing its job. So we think about pleural effusions and pneumothoraces uh, as causes of passive atelectasis and uh, causes of abdominal pain um, or any pain that prevents you from taking a deep breath. And then rarely neuromuscular disorders. Let's move on to our second type of atelectasis, adhesive atelectasis. And in this case, what I've drawn is a systematic representation of lots of alveolar sacs. Okay, that's what all these little blue cells are here. And each of these alveolar sacs is kind of moist on the interior surface uh, because you know the, um, there's probably water molecules there. Um, and as we remember, um, I think it's hydrogen bond forces between water molecules um, lead to a phenomenon called surface tension. Um, whenever you have a surface of water molecules, the water molecules pull you on each other in such a way to kind of minimize the surface area they present to the environment. Um, which means that uh, all of these, um, these, these surfaces of, of water along the inferior surface of the alveolar sacs, all, all those um, water molecules are trying to pull those sacs closed like that. Okay. Um, doesn't happen though. Doesn't happen because there's something that's opposing the desire of um, basically these water molecules surface tension to snap these alveolar sacs shut. And that something is surfactant, which acts kind of like detergent in terms of counteracting surface tension. However, if for some reason surfactant is not doing its job, the forces of surface tension went out and this can occur. So what are the causes of this second form of atelectasis where surface tension at the alveolar sac level is causing things to snap shut, things that interfere with um, proper functioning um, surfactant? Um, in adults, I think of aspiration. Uh, when we introduce hydrochloric acid from the gastric contents, um, that tends to uh, interfere with the ability of surfactant to do its job. And um, obviously, classically, in preemies um, who are deficient in normal surfactant production, this can happen too. Now, when we talk about these first two forms of atelectasis, passive and adhesive atelectasis, um, they tend to have a few ways of presenting on imaging in terms of morphology. Um, two of which I consider to be relatively specific, so that's great. And one uh, way, which unfortunately is sort of non-specific, which uh, results in us having a bit of a differential diagnosis. So the two more specific ways passive and adhesive atelectasis both can present is as a kind of a two-dimensional band, um, a parenchymal band, if you will. Um, generally happens um, um, in the lower lungs, not surprising because uh, when you think of the causes of um, passive atelectasis and the causes of adhesive atelectasis, those are generally lower lung phenomena. Um, that's where pleural fusions accumulate. That's where the diaphragm is. And that's also where people tend to aspirate. Okay. Um, occasionally, if you um, are CTing um, a band of atelectasis like this, it may actually look like a ground, at, ground glass passage sometimes. If the, the band happens to be perfectly transverse and in the same parallel plane as your, your axial CT image, you get this one image that kind of slices kind of through it and it looks kind of ground glassy. But if you change to a coronal or sagittal view, it's pretty evident what's going on. Um, second uh, relatively specific morphologic presentation of both passive and adhesive atelectasis is as a, more of a kind of a thicker triangular wedge-shaped opacity um, that presents with a relatively clean or sharp um, surface. 
Um, you may not see all surfaces because one may be touching the diaphragm, but the one that's kind of touching the rest of the aerated lung um, may be relatively conspicuous as a kind of a sharpish uh, interface. Um, generally, a pretty specific um, uh, way to recognize passive and adhesive atelectasis. Now, passive and adhesive atelectasis can occur sometimes in a third um, kind of uh, pattern, and that pattern is just a focal opacity that really doesn't have any sharp margin and not any, you know, obvious shape. Um, so to us, especially on an x-ray, it looks just like a patchy opacity and pretty hard to distinguish from consolidation. Um, and so and these are the cases of passive and adhesive atelectasis, which are nonspecific, that we have a tough time distinguishing from consolidation. So these are the cases where you're going to hear folks say, well, could be atelectasis, but can exclude pneumonia. So um, something to, to, to be aware of. So not every case of passive and adhesive atelectasis is potentially callable um, on a chest x-ray specifically. Um, these cases, however, on a CT scan should still be um, distinguishable most of the time from consolidation because you'll be able to discern whether there's volume loss or not. And that's the key. You don't expect to see volume loss of consolidation, but you would see it uh, with atelectasis presenting as a focal opacity. So um, again, so determining uh, whether you're dealing with uh, adhesive or passive atelectasis when it presents as a focal indistinct opacity or ill-defined opacity, uh, feasible on CT, but pretty tough on chest x-ray. Um, but when we try to kind of figure out what's going on when we're reading chest x-rays, we do keep a few things in mind. Uh, we understand that atelectasis is a much more common diagnosis than pneumonia on a case-by-case -case basis in folks in the, um, in the hospital. Uh, we also expect that atelectasis may wax and wane, whereas pneumonias tend to um, not change in a dramatic way from um, portable chest x-ray to portable chest x-ray to portable chest x-ray. And so if that opacity is changing a lot uh, from x-ray to x-ray, we may um, favor atelectasis over um, pneumonia. Um, but it's still tricky. Um, there are going to be plenty of times where both could be um, simultaneously happened in a patient, uh, in a patient who aspirates, for example. Aspiration can cause both adhesive atelectasis and aspiration pneumonia. So um, in the real world, things are not always as clear cut as we would hope. Um, so what do we do uh, when we um, see a focal opacity in the lower lungs? Um, yes, it could be adhesive or passive atelectasis, but yes, it could be pneumonia. Um, it's a matter of style. Um, so some people choose to just to say, well, this could be atelectasis or pneumonia. Um, some people try to be a little bit more specific or definitive, but um, no one's going to be perfect here. And what some people might choose to do is uh, make a judge of whether they think the patient is a high or low aspiration risk and um, bite the bullet and call the cases where you have a focal lower lung opacity um, uh, in a lower aspiration risk patient atelectasis. Understand that yeah, you're going to be wrong sometimes, at least maybe you're being more uh, binary in terms of your reads. Um, and people who are high aspiration risks, um, maybe you'll say adluxus and or aspiration pneumonitis uh, for the first 48 hours and then call it pneumonia after that. Because as we know, aspiration pneumonia doesn't happen immediately after the event. No perfect answer. Third form of adluxus is obstructive adluxus. Uh, to understand this mechanism, um, I'd like to kind of uh, talk about checking accounts as a kind of a uh, analogy. So um, if we look at a well-maintained checking account and the amount of money inside of it, we expect that amount of money to be relatively fixed, right? Um, you're using a checking account primarily to pay uh, your normal recurring expenses. And so money comes in and money leaves. And usually the amount of money should be relatively fixed. Um, Checking accounts are not great vehicles for saving. So um, if your checking account is going growing in size, probably not necessarily the most ideal condition. So we're going to be talking about a checking account that's being run at kind of a steady state kind of situation. Now, what would happen if um, you were unfortunately were to, say, lose your job or no longer be able to uh, replenish this checking account with income? Well, what happens is you're going to continue to have to pay the bills. Those are going to be still due. But the amount of money within that checking account is going to dwindle. And that is long and short um, the analogy for understanding how obstructive atelectasis works. So uh, we're going to draw a little kind of diagram to illustrate to us, us now. So what I've drawn here, um, pretend this represents a lobe, 
Um, and that blue line represents the airtight visceral pleural envelope along the exterior of this lobe. And this imaginary lobe has two segments, which we're just going to uh, just kind of um, define or, or, you know, with this dotted line. Okay. We know that, um, you know, this lobe is going to be, you know, kind of seeing a lot of blood coming and going, pulmonary artery, capillary bed, pulmonary vein. And just to simplify the drawing for this diagram, I've just drawn it like this. And we also know that this lobe is going to be supplied by airway, which I've drawn really, really simply as just this, this Y-shaped bronchus that just bifurcates once. Now, in normal function of this lobe, um, gas comes in, hopefully a bit of oxygen, um, slowly diffuses from the tracheal bronchial tree and the air spaces across the capillary wall into the bloodstream, and then gets carried to where it needs to go. And that's, you know, how things work. And then obviously um, some of that gas and oxygen get metabolized and then may leave the patient through any of the, this lobe or any of the other lobes. And in this kind of situation, everything's great. Um, lobes full of gas. You're constantly bringing gas in and gas goes away, but then gas comes in again. Now, what would happen if we were to block off and occlude that lobar bronchus? Well, you still have a diffusion gradient of gas, and so gas will continue to leave the air spaces of the lobe and enter the bloodstream, but we're no longer able to replenish um, that, that gas. And whatever is metabolized as carbon dioxide is going to preferentially leave the other lobes because there's, you know, they communicate with the air on the environment. And so you're going to start seeing a situation where you keep on bleeding gas away from this lobe and failing to replenish. And so the gas content relative to the soft tissue content continues to decline and the lobe becomes denser and smaller and um, eventually just is tissue at this point with very little gas. This is how obstructive atelectasis occurs. In adults, sublobar atelectasis generally does not occur. Um, so if we were to include a, a segmental or subsegmental bronchus, we generally don't see the phenomenon of obstructive atelectasis. Why? Well, it turns out that um, gas molecules can move from one segment of a lobe to another segment of that same lobe, sometimes without having to travel through the tracheal bronchial tree. Um, I like to use the analogy of IKEA uh, for this analogy. Uh, for those of us who've been to Ikea, you kind of know that this is large pathway with arrows that represents the chosen path that you use to get from like kitchenware to dining room to bedrooms or whatever. But we're also probably aware that there are these little, little shortcuts that permit you to jump from one area to another within the store without having going through the, the high volume kind of um, um, arrow marked pathway, these little shortcuts. Well, something like that. Um, exists within the lung as well. Uh, we call those shortcuts um, basically these uh, um, canals of Lambert pores of Kuhn. Um, and these shortcuts permit gas to move from one area of lung to another without having to travel through the tracheobronchial tree. We call this phenomenon of kind of air moving from one area to, of a lobe to another without going through the tracheobronchial tree. Uh, we call that phenomenon collateral air drift. And so that phenomenon is enough to keep the occluded part of that lobe air filled so you don't get obstructive atelectasis um, at a segmental or subsegmental level. Um, now, it doesn't say you don't you can't get um, obstructive pneumonia, but that obstructive pneumonia is a different phenomenon than obstructive atelectasis. Um, you might have also noticed that I was trying to be careful um, about talking about adults um, because um, sublobar obstructive atelectasis may occur sometimes in children. Um, in children, sometimes those collateral um, pathways for air drift um, have not uh, developed fully yet. So what are the causes for obstructive atelectasis? Well, think of anything that can occlude a lobar central airway. Think of things like a cancer. Think of things like a big fat mucus plug or occasionally foreign bodies. There are other less common things, but those are probably the big three I'd think of that you're going to see most often as a cause of obstructive atelectasis. Now, what's interesting is when obstructive atelectasis occurs, it happens at a lobar level, not a subsegmental or a segmental level. And so usually the whole lobe is going to go down in these cases. 
And when a lobe goes down, um, it tends to go down in very predictable ways in human beings. So um, when, say, the right upper lobe collapses due to obstructive atelectasis, it's going to occur the, pretty much the same way in every patient. So um, there's these five prototypical appearances of obstructive lobar atelectasis we should be recognize, uh, be able to recognize. Okay, and the lobes collapse in in predictable ways um, because they live in you know um, this airtight hemithorax, and things are going to shift appropriately because uh, if one lung, if one lobe collapses, the other lobe will expand to fill up its space, and fissures will shift in predictable ways. So let's talk about these appearances. All right, so when right upper lobes collapse um, due to obstructive atelectasis, they'll collapse in a predictable way. Okay. Now, the uh, minor fissure uh, in a properly inflated lung is usually visible in profile on a frontal chest x-ray. So you're going to be able to see the edge edge on, potentially, um, or it's at least presenting um, in profile. And on a lateral image, the major fissure um, is usually presenting relatively in profile, so edge on. When a right up lobe collapses, it collapses both superiorly and medially, kind of like a closing fan, closing up against the mediastinum. And on the lateral image, um, it also looks like a closing fan, closing kind of towards the apex. Uh, that's the typical look of right up lobe atelectasis. And what's interesting is, is that that minor fissure will remain in profile as the kind of right up lobe swings up and medial. And because it's still in profile on a chest x-ray, you're going to see a pretty clean demarcation interface between atelectasized right upper lobe that's small and lucent um, rest of lung um, that's, uh, you know, kind of um, going to look blacker. But the interface is going to be sharp because the minor fissure has collapsed medially and up but remains in profile on the frontal x-ray. Um, you probably might not be able to see it. Um, lobar, right upper lobar atelectasis on a lateral because um, even though the fissures may be in profile, there's a lot of stuff that's going to block your ability to see that atelectasized lung because mediastinum's there and the patient's shoulders are also overlapping this area of lung um, on a lateral image. Um, in some cases of um, right upper lobe obstructive atelectasis, um, the atelectasis will occur partway and then stop. Stop because um, in some people, um, you might have eventually incited a obstructive pneumonia to occur. And so that kind of takes up a little bit of volume and space. So you collapse and you can't collapse all the way because now there's some fluid and pus perhaps in that right upper lobe. And in some cases, you might even see the mass. Um, if it ha happens to be cancer, it's causing um, the right upper lobe atelectasis um, as a sizable kind of opacity, which we'll get to in about two slides. So anyways... Um, this is an example of right upper lobar atelectasis. Um, you can see there's a very, very sharp interface between opaque and lucent lung on the right side. That interface, there's, there's very few things that are going to be this smooth and sharp for this long a distance that isn't a fissure. Uh, that represents minor fissure. So all that white lung on one side is atelectasized right upper lobe, and all the black lung on the other side is lucent right middle right um, and right lower lobe. I guess it would be uh, primarily probably right middle lobe on this image here. Okay. Um, so right upper lobar obstructive atelectasis looks like this. Remember, the minor fissure normally should be more low and horizontal, and you see how it's kind of folded medial. It's, it's traveled medially and up in this case, not in its typical location. Here's a case of right upper lobar atelectasis where you can actually see the mass that caused it to happen. Um, that drawing we showed you two um, slides ago. Um, when right upper lobe atelectasis presents in the setting of the mass that's causing it, you see this kind of this S-shaped interface. Um, it's traditionally called um, golden S sign. Right middle lobes collapse differently than right upper lobes. Right middle lobes tend to collapse um, down uh, inferiorly and medially. So they start approaching the where the heart is, um, if you look at it on a frontal image. Um, if you look at how right middle lobe atelectasis occurs on the lateral image, um, it kind of just closes in like a fan. Now, um, when we look at um, right middle lobe atelectasis, uh, the, the, uh, the minor fissure, which normally is relatively horizontal and in profile when the lungs are inflated, um, it's going to shift 
medially, whoops, medially and inferiorly. Now, what's interesting when what it does this is it also torques in such a way that you no longer see the minor fissure on edge anymore. Okay, when right middle lobe atelectasis occurs, the minor fissure is going to shift. So now you're going to be staring at it obliquely through the surface um, obliquely that plane. That's the um, that's the minor fissure. So even though, yes, the, um, there's a sharp delineation between atelectasized middle lobe and loosened upper lobe, because you're no longer steering at the interface on edge, but kind of through it obliquely, you're going to recognize it as a kind of indistinct margin, at least. It looks indistinct um, on a frontal chest x-ray. On the lateral x-ray, um, when middle lobe atelectasis occurs, um, the minor and major fissures um, are usually um, kind of presenting themselves edge-on. And they remain that way even as that lobe kind of collapses down like a fan. And so you'll recognize right middle lobe atelectasis on the lateral as a thin sliver of density that has sharp margins on its superior and its kind of inferior surfaces. So here is an example of right middle lobar atelectasis. So on the frontal x-ray, we see an opacity that's kind of in, but on the medial lower right chest, but there's no sharp line or interface between the atelectatic white right middle lobe and the loosened darker right upper lobe because the minor fissure um, is not being presented to us on edge but rather obliquely. However, on the lateral image there's a, basically a, a density um, and that's very, uh, it's very uh, kind of a thin white wedge that's in the anterior inferior portion of that lateral x-ray um, that is almost kind of uh, the same width of, as a rib here. Um, that's um, the atelectasized right middle lobe has a very, very clean inferior and superior margin. So with right middle lobar atelectasis, I'd say the lateral image is pretty specific. Frontal image, unfortunately not, because uh, right middle lobar atelectasis and a right middle lobe pneumonia, to me, all look the same on a frontal. All right, right lower lobes, how do they collapse? Right lower lobes collapse posteriorly and inferiorly um, when they collapse. And what's interesting is um, when they collapse, um, if you look at, say, the frontal image, uh, you don't ever see the major fissure in a properly inflated uh, lung um, on edge on the frontal image. You're kind of staring at it like obliquely through the plane. But what's interesting is as the right middle lobe collapses posteriorly and fairly and also medially, um, that major fissure gets actually brought into a more profile edge on orientation so that you will recognize white lung, sharp interface, and then black lung, um, black aerated right middle and right upper lobe on the other side. Um, something kind of the opposite occurs on your lateral image. Um, the major fissure is usually in profile um, in a properly inflated right lower lobe, but as the lower lobe collapses posteriorly and inferiorly, that major fissure actually shifts in obliquity, and so you no longer get to see it um, edge on when the lower lobe is atelectasized and what you look at it kind of obliquely. So again, the interface looks kind of indistinct, not because it's not sharp, but because you're actually staring at it um, obliquely as opposed to edge on. And so here's an example of right lower lobar obstructive atelectasis. Um, you see there's an opacity on the frontal image in the medial lower right chest, and there's a nice long smooth interface that represents the major fissure on edge with white um, atelectasized right lower lobe on one side, and then black loosened lung on the other. And if you look at the lateral image, you'll probably just recognize kind of an indistinct opacity. It looks a little bit whiter. Um, that's uh, overlapping the lower spine, but there's no clear interface between it and the more blacker normal aerated lung because the interface that would represent the major fissure is being kind of seen. We're kind of viewing it obliquely as opposed to edge on. All right, left upper lobes. Left upper lobes collapse anteriorly um, at us, basically. So um, here's how upper lobes on the left side collapse. All right, so in these cases, um, the on the lateral image, you'll see the major fissure, which is usually presenting edge on, um, kind of shift more and more anterior. Um, but um, on the frontal image, you're just going to perceive a density that's relatively homogeneous. Um, as the lung becomes more and more opaque because we're going to be shooting x-ray photons through a band of atelectasized tissue. Um, here's a typical look of left upper lobar atelectasis. Now in that lateral image, that clean interface between atelectasized white left upper lobe and 
and black lucent left lower lobe on um, that interface that uh, left major fissure is still edge on but it is actually shifted anterior from where it normally would be on the frontal image what do we see well if you compare the left lung from the right lung you may recognize the left lung is just more homogeneously white because all the photons have to travel through that band of adult sized lung in this patient um, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens in some people with uh, left upper lobar atelectasis, and what happens in some people is a little bit of air-filled lucent superior segment left lower lobe actually shifts to the apex, and so you get this kind of a little bit of a kind of a crescentic kind of a dark air lucent area at the apex of the um, left chest, um, which represents just a, uh, a portion of aerated superior segment left lower lobe getting shifted to the apex, uh, which is uh, sometimes called the loof sickle or air sickle sign. Um, so the classic um, sign of uh, left upper lobar obstructive atelectasis. Last but not least, uh, left lobar um, obstructive atelectasis occurs pretty much identical rules as on the right side for right lower lobar atelectasis. Um, and so uh, with this case of uh, left lobar, um, left lower lobar obstructive atelectasis, uh, we'll see actually two clean interfaces, one representing the margin of the heart, the other representing the major fissure on the left um, in profile um, with lucent black aerated left upper lobe on one side and white opaque atelectasized left lower lobe inferiorly on the other side of that interface. And again, the uh, same problem as with right lower lobar obstructive atelectasis, we see an indistinct opacity in the posterior inferior kind of um, chest uh, but no sharp uh, delineation from the rest of the aerated lung because that sharp delineation that would be the major fissure is uh, no longer on edge, but being viewed um, op um, obliquely. Um, with obstructive atelectasis of any lobe, uh, you may see some secondary signs. Uh, because a whole lobe is now taken less space, um, mediastinum will shift to the atelectasized side. Hyla may shift as well. The hyla may shift upwards if the, an upper lobe is atelectasized. The hyla may shift slightly downward if the lower lobe has become atelectasized. Um, you may see the hemidiaphragm move um, because the lung is taking less volume than it did before uh, when there's a whole lobe down. And there's a phenomenon called the juxtaphrenic peak, which we may see in cases of upper lobe um, atelectasis. With upper lobe atelectasis, um, the, pulp, the ligaments um, that um, kind of um, are attached to the diaphragm get pulled up and what was previously a nice smooth arch um, arc shape to your diaphragm forms a little tiny pointy steeple we call a juxtaphrenic peak. Um, so um, obstructive atelectasis, a few last moment tips. Um, I'd say that for recognizing obstructive atelectasis, um, lateral x-ray is very helpful. Um, you can see for a lot of these um, examples we just showed, the, the, the uh, specific findings on the lateral, not the frontal image. And just uh, kind of a knowledge of how long it takes, people estimate it probably takes about 24 hours of um, airway obstruction for these signs to manifest. All right, last but not least, cicatricial atelectasis, the fourth and final um, form we want to discuss today. Cicatricial atelectasis occurs when scarring occurs that binds and straitjackets lung from being able to pop open and expand. Um, so uh, what we're going to see is atelectasis that's, um, you know, kind of conforming to the shape of a scar. Um, so oftentimes uh, what you are calling scar in the lung may be actually mostly atelectasis with a little bit of scar. Uh, but the morphology is going to be uh, not a nice little fluffy opacity, not anything like the lobar patterns we've seen, um, but it will be kind of nasty looking like the way we normally expect a scar to look. Um, bands, um, kind of irregular shapes with some retraction and volume loss. That's what we expect to see. Um, things that are going to cause cicatricial atelectasis are basically, uh, that, you know, so cicatricial atelectasis basically, uh, for all intents and purposes, looks like scar. Um, causes are going to be anything that um, can scar lung um, or scar pleura because um, pleural scarring will cause lung to get bound sometimes and unable to expand fully. So think chronic infections, think chronic inflammatory conditions in the lung, and then also think of, you know, plural infectious and inflammatory processes. Anything on that list could potentially cause scarring that leads to cicatricial atelectasis. Morphology looks like scar. Oftentimes scar looks like bands. So band, bands are not an uncommon uh, morphology for cicatricial atelectasis.
Um, and then there's the rare situation we discussed in our specific lung nodule mass talk, where um, two-dimensional centripetal, centripetal um, um, fibrosis of visceral pleura causes um, lung to be atelectasized in a kind of a, a ball um, we call round atelectasis. So here's an example of cicatricial atelectasis in the um, posterior lower lungs here. You can see these kind of these um, curvilinear bands um, that look a lot like scar because after all, it is in fact scar that's causing this. And as we discussed um, in our prior talk on uh, specific lung nodules and masses, uh, round atelectasis is a variant type of atelectasis where instead of having visceral pleura scar in one dimension and forming a band of atelectatic lung, visceral pleura is scarring in two dimensions centripetally and causing lung to be bound into an atelectatic uh, kind of ball um, with blood vessels that instead of diverging as you move to the periphery, converge and look a little bit like a comet. Um, round atelectasis and an example or two um, that I think we showed also in our specific lung nodule mass talk. So there you have it, um, a review of atelectasis, um, a court, um, organized by pathophysiology, um, just to reinforce the fact that um, these four different mechanisms have different causes and often with uh, unique imaging uh, presentations compared to the other forms of atelectasis. And it's kind of important to understand this so that when we see um, these imaging features, uh, be able to recognize which are the, what the mechanism might be. And sometimes those mechanisms uh, we can ignore. Um, and then sometimes those mechanisms may be something um, that we need to work up. 